Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Glad to be with you all on this uh, Sunday, October 18th. It's kind of sunny and cloudy out, but it's a warm day. We're yeah. glad that you are here with us as we uh, resume our journey through seven books that rock the, the church. church. Yeah. Do, does October 18th have any significance to you, Scott? Yeah, it's Carrie Bell's birthday at church. I just <laughs> saw this today. <laughs> Anything fun. else? Happy birthday. Uh, <laughs> but today is Scott's big yeah. drum, drum roll there. 70th birthday. Yep. Yay! Yep. Yippee! Yep. And when you get this far, you're just, you're glad for everyone. It feels good to make 70. It sure does. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. Of course, so. I won't be there for like a really long <laughs> no. time. But um, <laughs> anyway. Today is our third day of celebrating. Yeah, yeah, we kind of turn everything into a big birthday extravaganza, don't we? We do. We do. It's fun. We do. It is fun. fun. It only yeah. comes around once a year for I mean, each person. Sure, why not? It's COVID. Why not yes. have an extravaganza? That's right. <laughs> and you girls will appreciate this since Scott's birthday is October 18th. That means if we go to Kendra Scott... He can, he can buy me for his birthday one piece of jewelry at half price. Oh, we got to do that this week then, <laughs> we don't do. we? Yes, we yes. Do. You're always glad to see my birthday come. <laughs> you and Kendra Scott. At least one extra present for me. How many year, how many earrings can a person have? <laughs> <laughs> There's no limit on jewelry. <laughs> I figured that out already. So And many thanks to, oh, I see you have a lot of birth, birthday well wishes popping up here on the comment section. So... Thank you very much for that. It is great to be here. And I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that I get to share this part of my birthday with you guys as we yes. come together. It's, it's still odd that we are doing it this way. I, will t I guess I should update you because I did talk about this a little bit. You know, we had talked about basically just starting up class like right now and seeing who would come on a Sunday morning. And for a few reasons, Patty and I decided against that. And so here's what the current plan is. The current plan is to resume our Sunday morning class in Smith Worship on November 30th, which is the first Sunday in Advent. Because we thought it might work a little better if it was Advent and we could turn it into a Christmassy thing and get more people to come. And, and um, so we're probably going to be reaching out to you all about ways we could accomplish that. It would open with the same restrictions as in worship. We will have to be max, basked, and distanced, and there won't be enough space for everybody yeah. and all of that. But um, anyway, that's what we're thinking about now. So I appreciate everybody's patience as we're trying to work through the best way to do this and yes. meet everybody's desires and concerns. So anyway, yeah, so we'll see what happens with that over the next few weeks. Yep, we I have no crystal ball. All my plans are made in, I don't know what, cottage cheese? Why cottage <laughs> cheese? <don't> know. <laughs> or something just able but to be changed We easily. We have seen the room, um, just so that people wouldn't think that you'd walk into Smith and there'd be like the 300 chairs set up and you'd have to kind of walk around people and that. The way they have set it up in kind of like a little test for Scott um, is that there's only... A uh, little group of chairs together, two or three, if there's a party of two or three together, uh, you know, a few single chairs, a few two chairs, and so that's how the room is set up. Yeah. So everybody would be it's six be feet a, away minimum from your party. Yeah. Kay's going to be, Kay Richardson will have it well thought out. So yes. we'll see what comes with all that. But anyway, guess and we're, we're going to try to make it super Christmassy. Super, Super Christmassy. Christmassy. I'm not sure exactly that what mean that... Big, like what? That mean like big presents for everybody or what? That, Probably not that. Not that. But they can, <laughs> okay. they can bring us presents. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So anyway. Uh, I'm thinking of little uh, individual... You're shameless, uh, aren't you, honey? Little individually wrapped <laughs> yeah. treats of some yeah, sort we're instead of donuts stuff. or yeah. something like that. We're, we we're going to come up with something. Because we can't do food. We, we can't do way. food that's unwrapped and, and set consumed out. there in the room yes unless you carefully pull down your mask and eat it at yeah, your table yeah, eat it yeah. where you're sitting okay which is what most people do with their donuts yeah i do well we'll see what Kay says so anyway anyway all right so i think i would open this up with prayer now please do we'll plunge in got a lot to cover today Sounds great. okay would you pray with me gracious lord we are grateful to be back together we missed last week um but we are grateful to be here today uh, and we just pray that your Holy Spirit would move among us and help us to uh, 
really kind of comprehend uh, the challenges that have faced the church and faced Christianity over the centuries and, and help us resolve to perhaps do a, a bit bit better, a bit wiser job of responding to some of those challenges because we still face them in our world now. That's the truth. Probably well until Jesus comes back. But we know that you are with us in this and we are grateful for that and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I just wanted to clarify one thing. I just saw a comment come up out of the corner of my eye and absolutely this class will still be online. St. Andrews oh, is yeah. going to have it all oh, yeah. set up. We assume there'll still be many more people watching it online than in person, at least in the beginning. We've already had the meeting. So the, it, it will go on exactly the same place it is now. So if you're an online participant, you will not notice any difference except we won't be in front of my books. We'll yes. be, you'll see us in Smith and Patty will be the mediator with all the comments on Facebook so that you can still reach and ask questions and stuff like that. Right? Right. Right. So right. that'll be good. Yeah. 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 So we're going to make it very much. Right. We're only adding something, not taking anything away. That's because really yeah. most people are, a lot of people are still online. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And very good. And there'll be much more room for me to do interpretive dance. Where yes, I'm we're so looking forward to that. Right here. We're looking forward to that. Yes, we we are. All right, friends. Let me get us re and resettled here. Um, okay. So sure enough, we're in this series, seven books that rock the church. So to get into today, we have to go back to two weeks ago when we were talking about, well, this is Calvin and Galileo and the tumult and so forth. But we also talked about Copernicus and how um, our understanding of the world was being turned upside down in, at this time in the 16th and 17th and the 18th centuries. And... Um, uh, when Copernicus did his work and Galileo did his, it just began to spur big thinkers to to do experiments and reconsider um, how we understood the world. Because for more than a thousand years before Galileo, um, uh, the world, the Western world anyway, was sort of ruled by the physics of Aristotle. And uh, that was what was taught, that was what was read, that was what was studied, um, and that was what was getting turned over, upside down in the world of, of, of Copernicus and Galileo and Newton and others. So let me just try to explain some of this. Okay, so... We're going to talk today about metaphysics, which is the nature of reality. And we're going to talk a little bit about physics, which is simply um, the science of change, how things change, how things move. And, and Aristotle had his ideas about that and proposed a whole theory that had dominated Western science for a millennium. And in Aristotle's physics, things move because they have a, this is going to be funny, they have a soul, a psyche, not not a soul like you and I think of it in a religious sense, but a, a, a psyche or a suke in the Greek that animates that living thing and causes it to move. And in Aristotle's physics, things move toward what is good for them. They move toward the good. So an animal will move toward food and water and so forth. So, so um, Aristotle's model of how it worked was turned upside down by Isaac Newton, um, who said, well, it, things don't really move because they're animated by some type of psyche or soul or consciousness or whatever you might want to call it, things move because of energy. That's it. It's just, it, and you can figure it out perfectly in Newtonian physics. If, you know, the um, what, the World Series is about to come up. When the, the ball arrives at the plate at 100 miles an hour and it encounters a round bat in 
you could, if you knew all the variables, you could figure out exactly what's going to happen with that ball when it encounters the bat. And that's Newtonian physics. And it was a completely different way of understanding how things are animated, how they move. And it's very empty of any meaning, any consciousness, anything like that, right? Because it's all just this thing called energy causing things to move around. And so the question is then, well, okay, but I have a consciousness. I have a consciousness. And is it just energy and stuff that that is that all my consciousness is made up of? Really? And today we talk about it as, well, what's the difference between the mind and the brain? If you read about artificial intelligence and, and what they're doing and all that, there's this lot of discussion about mind and brain, about body and and mind. And everybody knows if a brain surgeon cuts into your head, he can operate on your brain. He could dissect your brain. <laughs> Not a healthy thing for you. He could dissect your brain, but it doesn't mean that he has encountered your mind. So how do we do, what does that mean? And these questions, which we still ask today, are the questions on the table in the time, in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries. And, and various suggestions were made about, about how to bring that together. And one of them was made by a man you might have heard of named Gottfried Leibniz. I don't know. He doesn't get, he doesn't get the kind of press Newton does. This is Leibniz. What is the deal with that wig? Don't you wonder really? But he was a genius like Newton was and others from his time. The, uh, Leibniz was what they called a polymath. A polymath was somebody um, who was well versed in a number of different fields. Um, and sometimes today I think we might use the term Renaissance man, but that's what it goes back to. So Leibniz is one of these geniuses that came into the world and, and worked in a lot of different fields. One of them was um, he and Newton argued about who invented calculus. History graded Newton to be the winner of that, but Leibniz, some of his note, calculus notation we still use today. So Leibniz considered this business of this mind-body connection, as it were, um, the nature of, of how things move. And he proposed this kind of odd thing, and we're, we're getting to some theology in a minute here that actually everything is made up of these tiny, tiny, tiny little particles. Tiny, tiny, tiny little, like, kind of like atoms, except all of them have a consciousness. And some of them have a real brilliant, vibrant consciousness, and some of them have a dull, essentially dead consciousness. So, and he called them monads. Mm -hmm. So he's a monad. You like that, Patty? A monad. I might have been called that by somebody in the past. I don't know. Anyway, a monad. And so, so rocks are made up of dull monads that really have hardly any consciousness left at all or none, or whatever you think about Leibniz. But people, you know, we have a consciousness, and what gives rise to that consciousness is are our monads. And so then he realized, well, how do these monads actually interact? If I slap you on the back, what actually causes you to react? How do they, and he couldn't really, in the end, what he, his proposal was that it was God who created all of that, that it was God who arranged in perfect harmony the interactions amongst all these monads, amongst you and me and the rocks and the trees and me, all these interactions. God arranged everything. It may look like, I don't know, the old illustration, it may look like if I hit a billiard ball and it hits another ball, it may look like the first one is affecting the second, but that's actually already been pre-established by God. And then Leibniz went one step further and he said, okay, so this world that you and I live in is the best of all possible worlds because God is loving and God is good and he arranged everything into the best possible way it could be arranged in keeping with God's love and goodness. Okay? 
So, this idea, so the phrase to remember when we come to today's book, which is Candide, is this, the best of all possible worlds. Because when Voltaire wrote his novel, he has a, a teacher in it named Dr. Pangloss, who embraces this theology of Leibniz, that this world we live in is the best of all possible worlds. So that's the first thing we want to plant away. All I got to remember is the best of all possible worlds. That, that's Leibniz's view, all set up by God. Everything has been set up by God, utterly and completely. There is no interaction between any two things, any two events, anything that wasn't prearranged and pre-established by God, right? So, I guess I should explain that word theodicy at the bottom. Theodicy, the, what would I say, the D-C at the end, the D-I-C-Y, comes from a Greek word, the Greek word for righteousness. So, theodicy is a discussion of how could there be bad things in a world created by a good and loving God. That's, is God really righteous? And um, it's, it's, a big, it's a big question, and, and it's a question that Voltaire is going to pose to Leibniz. Okay, so let me go on just a tiny bit. Voltaire was one of three shining lights in the French Enlightenment in the 18th century. Um, which, interestingly, is um, John Wesley was a man of the 18th century as well. So the three were Voltaire, Rousseau, and Diderot. Probably if you're like me, you know, I mean, you know, I had a public school education. So <laughs> I remember these names, but I can't say, you know, I easily remember kind of what all they all wrote and what they all believed and everything. So I've kind of refreshed a lot or learned a lot in the course of this. But these three gentlemen, Voltaire, Rousseau, and Diderot, were the shining lights in France in the Age of Enlightenment. And the Age of Enlightenment is what created the modern world in which you and I inhabit. And a lot of the questions that we ask in the world, the secular world we see out there, that world which seems to want not have any real time for Jesus or God or any of that stuff, the stuff you all talk to me about all the time, that world is born in the Age of Enlightenment, fueled by the advances in science, which were overturning all the old authorities and so forth, um, overturning Aristotle, overturning the, the, the books and teachings that had dominated the West for a thousand years, more than a thousand years, since Aristotle, who lived before Christ. The Age of Enlightenment. So, this is a famous painting and it doesn't all these are various luminaries in the age of enlightenment various famous writers and philosophers and this so forth but the three whoops okay all right so here are the three basic ideas that came out of this enlightenment and these my friends they still drive um, at least a couple of them drive the, the secular world that we really inhabit in a way. The first is rationalism. This is the idea that reason, our thinking, is the chief source and test of knowledge. Now, we are Methodists, and we affirm that Scripture is the ultimate authority. And we affirm that we interpret scripture using our reason, using tradition, using our experience. But we claim that God has revealed himself to us in the pages of scripture. And that is God's revelation of himself is not something that we can reason our way to. We could never reason our way to an understanding that God would take on human flesh and be crucified on a Roman cross. That that is something God has revealed to us. Do you see the difference there? Yes. Okay. So this is a big point, right? So this is, you know, this is still something that, that people, of course, argue about today. What is the place of the Bible? What is the place of Revelation? Lauren Sandstead, who's down at Perkins Seminary, told me they're 
talk about this kind of thing still. So, the second thing is just sort of an anti-church attitude, anti-clerical deism. Um, the church has been filled with lots of abuses. You and I know that, right? I mean, gosh, the sex abuse scandal in the Roman Catholic Church is the worst thing that has confronted the church in my lifetime. The worst witness to Jesus, I, I don't understand it, how it could be tolerated, how it could be allowed to happen, I, I, just, I just don't. But I really understand how it could cause people to, to become very anti-clergy, very anti-Roman Catholic. And um, certainly in the Enlightenment, part of it was anti-clerical. Um, and it gave rise to what is called deism. I think I have that little word on the slide. Deism here, in opposition to Christianity. Deism is the belief that there is a God but that God is remote and absent, um, doesn't get involved in the world and so forth, did create everything, but that's really about as far as it goes. Really about as far as it goes. And deism was a very popular belief system in the 17th, 18th century. Um, I think in a way, for a lot of people it still is. It's kind of where they end up in their understanding of who God is. It's um, the belief system of Benjamin Franklin. It is the belief system of Thomas Jefferson. And it is, was the belief system of these Enlightenment thinkers. Okay? So when you come to Voltaire, this is him, okay? He and Bray, he was a deist and a rationalist himself. Now, I learned a few things about Voltaire I never know. I never knew. I... I had heard of Voltaire and I knew he was a big guy and but his name Voltaire is just a pen name Voltaire is not his actual name that's just a pseudonym he used um, his name was Francois Marie Arouet and he had a good long life you can see from this he lived to like 83 or 84 um, he didn't publish Candide until late in his life till he was in his 60s though it is the writing that he's most remembered for. He was a very prolific writer, led a very fascinating life, in and out of favor, most time out of favor, okay? Um, writing uh, literature, writing philosophy, um, uh, very, very well known in, in France. And when he wrote this famous novel of his called Candide, he didn't even publish it under the pseudonym Voltaire. He published it under another pseudonym, sort of a pen name of a pen name kind of thing. But everybody quickly realized, well, who had written this book? It was clearly Voltaire. And the book rocked Europe. It rocked the church. And we're going to explore why that is. And we're going to go back to the old Leibniz guy here in a minute. Because you're probably wondering why I talked about that stuff all the time, all that time. So... Any questions, thoughts, Patty? Uh, you just had a comment here by Chuck Hilke. Okay. Um, he said that Voltaire said the very first divine priest was the first rogue that met the first fool. <laughs> yeah, you see? Okay, so him. if y'all can see in your comment section what Chuck wrote, that express presses his anti-clerical viewpoint. And certainly, you know, the um, abuses in the Roman Catholic Church gave rise to the Protestant Reformation um, and abuses continued and it got wrapped up in political issues and all kinds of things um, uh, and it is really I, I'm just thinking of Arthur's sermon today at least the beginning of his sermon we at St. Andrew the staff the pastors the teachers we try very hard to be, to stay out of the political realm. And it's not because we don't care. I'm sure there's a wide range of disagreement on staff as there's a wide range of disagreement in the congregation. But the church has made lots of bad, bad choices in the past about 
political power, how it's used, about money, about lots of things that really don't have anything to do with preaching the good news of Jesus Christ and making disciples in this world. And so I think all of us in the church would be well advised to, to, to try to avoid some of those excesses and some of those problems in the past um, as best we can and um, not to give rise to, to, to a lot of people are harmed by that. I'm told that a lot of people are harmed by the churches they grow up in and that um, heck, Peter uh, Philip Yancey writes about that. That's just a terrible thing, a terrible thing, and and um, it can give rise to a lot of anti-church attitudes. And that certainly was a part was a part of the of, of the Enlightenment. So um, let me go back. Okay, so let's go to the third one. So the rejection of conventional moralism. Well, moralism is kind of a bad idea to start with. Moralism is the idea that, you know, I will uh, enforce my morals on you. Or, uh, But certainly the Enlightenment was about rejecting a lot of the conventional ways of the uh, church and, and average people and so forth. And so it, it was just kind of an overturning of a lot of things that had been taken for granted. That, that's really, you know, an essential part of what the Enlightenment was. Whoops. Okay, Scott. Okay, so this is Voltaire. So Voltaire, like Jefferson, like Lincoln, like others, many others, was a deist. Deists denied the divine providence of God, that God was actually, you know, moving things around to some greater purpose. He did, they, the deists denied special revelation um, that God spoke to people and that speaking and God working in this world was, um, was what was captured in scripture. They just rejected that idea um, of revelation. They embraced the idea of rationalism that that what we have is is our reason, and that needs to drive everything that we think and believe and do. They denied miracles. This is what Thomas Jefferson did. He took his New Testament, his Gospels, and he cut it all up, and he rearranged the pieces, cut everything supernatural, miracles, all that stuff. He took all that out of the New Testament, leaving a book of moral teachings from Jesus about how we ought to live with one another. So... And I have on my shelf some. I should have pulled it out so I could show it to you. That's what Jefferson's Bible is. It's a New Testament. It is the moral teachings of Jesus. And that's the deist way. What, as, I just can't help but ask you, what is the problem with only seeing in the New Testament the moral teachings of Jesus? Jefferson should have been smart enough to know this. The problem is nobody does it. Our problem is not the fact we don't know how we should live. We do know how we should live. We do know how we can live better lives. We do know how we can be kinder to people and more loving. We do know that, but we don't do it. That's the problem. Our problem is not a lack of knowledge. It is a lack of will because our will is in bondage to sin. It's not a lack of knowledge. The first week in this series was about um, Gnosticism. Gnostic, in Gnosticism, the problem is ignorance. That's not that's not humanity's problem. That's not humanity's problem. Humanity's problem is a lack of will to actually do what we know we should do. So, after that little speech, <laughs> the deist would of course deny the divinity of Jesus and that humans are even made in the image of God. So, almost Everything that you understand Christianity to be, the deists abandoned. And these were smart people, and they wrote well, and they, they wrote persuasively, and they made arguments, and a lot of them were good arguments, and it gave rise to the world in which, in which we live. In fact, it gave rise to a world in which, by and large, um, sort of the world and science and all that stuff was completely separated from the world of faith. 
like two different wings of a house and it would have no no interaction between the two because um, it just it's how faith came to be seen as just this internal little private thing well that's nice for you scott if you can do it not this big not not part of the public square right so All of this comes crashing together in this massive earthquake in Lisbon, Portugal on All Saints Day, no less than 1755. This was a massive earthquake, massive earthquake. Tens of thousands of Portuguese were killed. This, the capital was nearly destroyed. The city of, of Lisbon was nearly, uh, was just devastated. By the and of course this painting, which is kind of a famous, I don't know where it came from, um, ships and people and buildings, everything, on All Saints Day no less. And I'll just tell you, it just, it just, it just shattered a lot of the optimism in the world at the time. Think about what Leibniz said. Okay, God has put all this together. Therefore, because God is good and all loving, this is the best of all possible worlds. The things that aren't right in it are not right, They're tr but it's the best of all possible worlds. And so when the Lisbon is destroyed, it raises questions for people. Is this really the best of all possible worlds? How could that be? How could this Lisbon earthquake be part of some harmonious establishment of creation by God? How could it be part of the best of all possible worlds? It's the same question as people ask about, well, how would the Holocaust fit into the best of all possible worlds that God put together? Um, another historical example, the world, the Western world was filled with optimism at the turn of the 19th, of the, from, in 1900, from the 19th to the 20th century, filled with optimism. Science was creating a new world and things were moving forward and people were getting educated and, and life expectancy was skyrocketing upward as people embraced clean water and then electricity and on and on. And it just seemed like, wow, the world is on its way and then it was all shattered by the First World War. All that optimism crashed right into the First World War, just like all the optimism in 1755 crashed right into the Lisbon earthquake and raises these theological questions. Well, well, who is God? You're gonna tell me God arranged a world in which this Auschwitz? I've taught about this in our Sunday class. My answer to that, no, God didn't do that. And um, that was basically Voltaire's answer. So Candide was published just a few, year, few years after the um, earthquake in Lisbon. And let me just tell you what it is. Um, it is a very short little novel. Let me stand up for one second. I should have pulled this down. You can see in my entire shirt. Uh, this is a current edition of Candide with a lot of helps and stuff in it that and additions it kind of helps explain because there are things in it that need to be explained um, it's a very simple novel it's kind of a crazy little novel it's very action-packed um, the key character is named Candide he is a young man um, hardly more than a boy um, his name is Candide because Candide in French means naive optimism. And so he was, the little boy was an optimist, and he was raised in on the estate of this great German baron. And his teacher, tutor, was a Dr. Pangloss. The best of all possible worlds is what the name basically means. And the baron had a daughter, and he, Candide, fell in love with the daughter. And one day he was found dallying with the daughter, if you know what I mean. Yes, and he had to leave. 
And so then the rest of the book are all these long adventures of Candide. And he encounters the very worst of the world. What happens to the daughter later in life is terrible. Dr. Pangloss contracts syphilis and his nose is falling off. And there's war and rape and murder and just... And at the same time, there is this side of the book that has a lot of... Um, uh, birth and and kind of I don't know fun. We used to I, I used to, I would have used the word gay to talk about it if, if the meaning of the word hadn't changed. But in the old sense of the word, that's that's a lot of gaiety in in it. And these two things, sort of this this and each step of the way, as Candide runs into horror after horror and and priests and Jesuits and clergy who are utterly unhelpful in any of this, it's a raising the question of, is this really the best of all possible worlds? Right? He even runs again into Dr. Pangloss later, who has now lost his nose and so forth. And, and all the time, this is the question. When confronted with horror after horror after horror, how can you maintain that this is the best of all possible worlds created by a good and loving God. And it shook Europe. It expressed, I think, a lot of people's feelings and thoughts about their assumptions about God and about the world and creation and God's work in this world and the work of divine providence had all been shaken to the roots by this Lisbon earthquake. I really can't overstate it. I've run into it all the time in my reading, the effect of this Lisbon earthquake on European culture and theology that we are descendants of. And and the, if that's all that the novel did, it probably wouldn't have created the sensation that it did, okay? And wouldn't have rocked the church the way that it did. But see, this this is where Voltaire, as I said, wrote it late in life. He's in his 60s when he wrote it. And he knew that the most powerful tool that he could use to attack the clerics and to attack the church and to attack this theology was ridicule. Ridicule is powerful. Who likes to be mocked and ridiculed? It's, it, it's humiliating. It's different than just arguing why, why somebody's wrong. To ridicule them is something different. You know, y'all are welcome to argue with me about anything. But, but don't ridicule you. But don't ridicule me. That's not, that's, that, that. And it, you're going to be interested in this connection. Okay. So, some of you have probably heard of Saul Alinsky, who wrote a book called Rules for Radicals. That it gets some play here and there sometimes, okay? And so number five of his Rules for Radicals is ridicule. Ridic and here's what he wrote. Ridicule is man's most potent weapon. It's hard to counterattack ridicule, and it infuriates the opposition, which then reacts to your advantage power of ridicule and that is what Voltaire used it is the ridicule in the book of the church that created the biggest problem Voltaire's writings have been banned and unbanned and been denounced and stuff before but Candide was different it was different because of its pointed ridicule of the church and and so it it, it was banned not surprisingly um, and the church didn't want read, people to read it, not surprisingly, because the church was anxious to hand on to its power, the Roman Catholic Church. And I think a lot of that desire, the fervent desire, was driven by the continued um, work in the Protestant Reformation that was such a challenge to the Roman Catholic Church. So, wow. Saul Alinsky. Scott, 
Yes, Pat. I want to go back just a little bit. Um, okay. Sorry, uh, because Phil Young had posted a question. Yeah. Were any of our other presidents, other than Jefferson, known to be deists? I think George Washington was. Let's just do a little, okay. We'll do a little history here for a minute. <clears throat> there are, in the West, Europe, U.S., Canada, the rest, these, we call them Western democracies. Um, a lot of them were established around the same time um, in the modern sense of the word. And most of them have national churches. There's a National Church of France. There's a National Church of England. I'm talking national churches in the sense that taxes go to help support the church. But America doesn't have a national church because for the very particular time that America was established, 1776, 1780, America was not a very church-going country. At that time, less than one out of four Americans went to church. Um, deism as a philosophy slash theology was was pretty was pretty dominant um, and that is why there's no national church um, we have to keep this in mind when we read the founding documents about God that we don't read into that our full understanding of God revealed in Jesus Christ because that isn't what Jefferson would have meant and then in the early 19th century, about, I don't know, 25 years later, there began a great awakening in America, okay? A lot of religious revival and so forth in America. And Paul Johnson, a famous historian, said if America had been founded 25 years later or 25 years earlier, America too would have had a national church. But it's just an, almost an accident of history that America was founded at a time when there wasn't much wasn't much religion in America and that surprises people I, I you know I guess it's it should now this is not to say many signers of the Declaration of Independence were absolutely 100% Christian in the same sense that we are but some of the some of the guiding lights of it you know, particularly Jefferson right the uh, the, the philosopher um, and president uh, Jefferson was was a deist. Ben Franklin was a deist. I think Washington was largely a deist. Um, but many of the signers of the of the Ind Declaration of Independence and Constitution were were Christians in the re biblical revealed sense of the Bible way. We Hand did up, have Patty? A comment from uh, John Henson that he believes Madison also was a deist. What does he say? So John Henson said Madison's a deist. I, I buy that. It was just, <clears throat> it was it was a, a philosophy, an outlook that had um, America had imported from Europe, uh, and um, was was just at a time when it was pretty strong and pretty kind of popular and the way things are. But it passed, right? So 25 years later, America is going through this this great awakening and revivalism and gave birth to, for example, that's when uh, the Mormon church, Mormonism is born, out of the great revivals in New York State and Pennsylvania and Kentucky and so forth. So, yes, Patty? I had a question from Bill Brewer. Uh -huh. um, did deists believe in salvation or resurrection? Um, generally, yeah, it all defines how you, how you, not resurrection, so, but how would you define salvation? How would human, if we went back to a lot of the intellectual elites in America in 1910, how would they have viewed salvation? That we as a people were working our way toward it. That education and science and medicine as they advance will slowly turn the world into... Um, into the kind of place we all dream of, right? So, and that is what got shattered by the First World War, when it was clear that education and science and medicine and the rest were not, they don't 
have the power to overcome sin. And and so, but still, you know, it, it created a lot of sense of disillusionment. So imagine this. Imagine you're this optimistic sort of person in 1910 um, where the world is working its way toward, you know, the, the heavenly city, as it were, and it's shattered by the First World War, but you don't have anything to replace it with. It's not like you go running back to Jesus. You're, that's past. That's in your past. Instead, what you end up is with, is with despair and disillusionment. And so that becomes a dominant force in the intellectual life of, of Europe and America. The, the sense that, you know, it, it almost goes back to, well, you know, just take, just take the best out of life that you can and go on from there. You'll see this in a little bit at the end of Candide, where the, where the novel ends up. Because it isn't like for Voltaire when the Leibniz, Leibniz world collapses and the optimism collapses that Voltaire just just says, okay, well, we're going to go running back to Jesus and put all this stuff together. That is not, that is not the way the human mind works. <laughs> no, no, that's not it. So that's, that's a real good, real good, good question. I, I guess what I'd like us to carry away from this is how much these ideas and these thoughts and these perspectives shape shape the world in which you and I live now. You know, this is this is the history of book. These books express ideas, and the history of ideas is what creates the world we live in. Yes, technology has its place, and science has its place, and medicine, but the world is really created because 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 of ideas that that move the world forward and that shape how we see things should we be optimistic is there such a thing as revelation is it are we stuck only within ourselves the answers to those questions are are what are what drives the world um okay scott you do have a question from kent davidson since our country was based on freedom of religion among other values then what would a national church been based on? <laughs> whatever the Good most, question. whatever the largest number would have agreed upon. And we need to understand that yes, the U.S. there people that came to the U.S. to found the country were were fleeing um, religious persecution in some cases from where they came from. But what happened when they got here? Were all the colonies flourishing little villages of religious freedom? No, no, they were not. It is because why? Why is it so? Because of sin. And, and so, um, uh, I forget some of this. I think Rhode Island was founded by people who were fleeing another colony in America, right? To seeking religious freedom. Um, it's It's just kind of... It's just it's just kind of how we are. So yeah, I think Paul I think Paul Johnson is right that if America had been founded 25 years later, there would have been some sort of national church. But it's a honestly for me it's a blessing we 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 don't because I I am, you know I I think um, uh, the the further the body of Christ stays away from political power the better in my view. I don't think we do well with it. I don't think the history would say we've done well with it. So, all right. Anything else there, Patty? No, I think. Okay, so let me go back. Just, of course, so Voltaire's Candide rocks the church, feeding this, this ferment after Lisbon, and it, it ends up getting expressed in lots of ways, but firmly in the French Revolution. So here's Robespierre, a leader in the Revolution, here is storming the Bastille in the Revolution. Um, uh, tens upon tens of thousands of French clerics were either um, uh, deported, executed, a lot of heads rolled, or simply demoted and lost their jobs. So, 
So the French Revolution was a revolution not just against the royalty, but it was a revolution also against against the clerics and against the church and, and gave rise to all sorts of excesses. And on, this is fascinating. So on, let me see the date, June 1794, a few years after the revolution started, there was a festival of the Supreme Being just north of Paris. Huge crowds. They built this huge um, monument thing. Maybe that's what that's supposed to be in the background of this. Anyway, they built this huge monument kind of thing, composed of all kinds of materials, higher and higher, and they put at the top what? A statue of Hercules. A statue of Hercules at the top. Uh, and it was a festival to the supreme being. You see the God of Thomas Jefferson or the God of Ben Franklin or the God of Voltaire. Um, not the God who reveals himself to Abraham and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God who, who no, it's, it's just, it's this idea of a supreme being. So in that world is one we'd all have to admit, you know, is really, is really still with us. You. And sadly, it's one in which, you know, young people in vast numbers are leaving any notion of, of religion or belief in God. When you look at the Gallup polls and other things where like 40% of those under 30 are <coughs> locked themselves down as having no religion whatsoever. And I bet if you interview them, because I, like I know, because I've read some of the research, if it isn't that they don't have an idea of some sort of supreme being, but that's about the only idea they have, right? Maybe this supreme being helps them out a little bit now and then, but by and large, it's just, yeah, there's something, but off they go. So, so let me get back to the end of Candide, because this will tie into something that we were just talking about. Here is the closing paragraph of Candide. So after all of this horror mixed with mirthful moments has been confronted by Candide has really shattered his optimism, right? He's he, about the world and world events. This is, quote, best of all possible worlds. He He's sitting with his old tutor, Dr. Pangloss, in a garden. Beautiful place. And Pan, Dr. Pangloss, we're told, would sometimes say, all events form a chain in the best of all possible worlds. In the end, if you had not been given a good kick up the back backside and chased out of a beautiful castle for loving Miss Cunagon, and you hadn't been subjected to the Inquisition, that's part of what happens to him, and if you hadn't wandered about America on foot, and if you hadn't dealt the bear in a good blow with your sword, and if you hadn't lost all your sheep from that fine country of El Dorado, you wouldn't be here right now eating candied citron and pistachio nuts. Right? And Candide just looks at him and says, well, that's well put, but famous phrase, we must cultivate our garden. We must cultivate our garden. If you, if you, you could type that into Google. We must cultivate our garden. By which Voltaire meant that in the face of these horrors, whether it's the earthquake or the Inquisition or the abuses of the clergy, move to our time and make up your list. In the face of all of this, what should we do? We should cultivate our garden. We should live our lives as best we can growing flowers, you know, a, a life withdrawn from the world really is what Candide is talking about at the end of the novel. And um, this is always very tempting to Christians, right? It's very tempting to Christians to withdraw from the world. The more secular the world becomes, the, the more violent the world becomes, the more over-sexualized the world becomes, the more anti-God the world becomes, the more Christians are tempted to, to, to withdraw from the world. There was an excellent book written lately. I call it excellent. It was well-reviewed. I didn't read it. Um, uh, by a Christian who advocated simply that, that in the face of the way the direction the world is taking, the Christians need to just kind of withdraw. 
and live as a community, grounded in love, taking care of one another, and so forth. And that's where Candide, that's how Candide ends, right? In the face of optimism, what do you do? You just withdraw and you tend your, you cultivate your garden, to use the phrase. But of course, that is not, that is not what Jesus wants from us. We might want to withdraw and become insular and, and just focus internally and, and on and love and so forth. But no, Jesus said, go. Be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Go, make disciples of all nations. Go, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So no matter the, the, the Christian response to the horrors of this world or not to withdraw from this world, they are to run into the world proclaiming Jesus Christ. I read the other day a good little, maybe it was a tweet or something from Beth Moore, who lives down in Houston about, you know, she was just reflecting on the world and she said, you know, it, you just have to cling tighter and tighter to Jesus and you have to be ready to spread the good news of Christ. That, that's it. And that's a very different response from the response of, of, of Voltaire. So, you know, why is this book one of seven books that rocked the church? Because it encapsulated so well the, the, um, anti-church sentiments of the Enlightenment, the abandonment of traditional theology and morality, um, and was a key part of giving birth to the secular modern world that you and I, um, in which you and I live, in which you and I live. So when we come together next week, we're going to go to another book that rocked the church. You know, a lot of these are about how the church reacts to these books. So next week, we're, we're going to talk about Charles Darwin and his work, his book, Origin of Species. Um, you can imagine the kind of things we're going to talk about next week. Um, and I'm going to ask you to contemplate in between now and then the difference between biology and philosophy or theology. What's the difference between biology and philosophy or biology and theology? So, so we'll talk about that next week. And I have one other little tidbit for you. You may know this. I was reminded of this, that in the 1950s, Leonard Bernstein wrote an operetta called Candide. And it is, he took the story of Candide and using somebody's libretto, he put it to music. And I think this is a cover of the original Broadway recording of Candide. So you might check it out on Apple Music or Amazon Music or wherever you listen to if you want to hear Bernstein's Candide. So, wow. You know, we had to cover a lot of ground today, but but it's really, it's really just, you know, people will say, you know, like, like what's happening in the world around us and what are we going to do about it? I can think of... of a lot of times I've got I've gotten questions like that, and the truth is, the truth is that we we need to understand the secular world and the and how it where it came from. Otherwise, you kind of feel like you're a kid trying to get at a pinata with a blindfold on. Yes. We need to know what their questions and answers are so that we can propose a different way. So you, we can say to them, no, in the face of, of horrors, you don't just have to tend, cultivate your own garden. You can, come, you can come to Jesus. That's the garden you want to be part of. Mm -hmm. So anyway, True. all right, friends, Darwin next week. That should be a hoot. <laughs> and then supposedly coming up, we have Sigmund Freud and Karl Marx coming up. Holy cow, what am I going to do with those, Patty? I don't know. I what don't know. Do. <laughs> the, the first couple were really hard, but I think the next ones are going to be... Um, well, they'll still be hard for you. You're the one who has to prepare, but I think that people will we're more familiar happy with Freud and Marx. Something. Yes, but they're no, they're not more significant in our world than Voltaire was. No, and, and his associate. I mean, they really laid the groundwork for the world in which we find ourselves even now. So, okay, Did you hear Very good. talk about Darwin all the know, time, all the time. 
all the time. So, so there should be a hoot. Be Don't want to miss next, next week, I guess, no. right? No. <laughs> Call me and I'll reserve you a spot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway. All right, honey. Okay. I'm going right. to close this I in prayer. I am going to close us all in prayer. Thank you all for being here with us today. Um, you know, we appreciate it. I saw a lot of friendly. Very much appreciate all the all the birthday Boy, well wishes. Boy, you got a lot of birthday wishes today. That's awesome. You do. Awesome. I need them. You do. Oh, I do. You do. Keep us all going. You're doing great. I am going. I'm, yeah. <laughs> anyway, please join me in prayer. Holy Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day today. We thank you, God, for every person who is gathered here with us today. We are so grateful, God, for this technology that we're able to do this. I know I've been saying this now for almost eight months, but it's so true that we still feel connected and we still feel part of this wonderful family of, of a Sunday school class, part of St. Andrew, and then part of the whole Christian world. And we just thank you, God, so much for that. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will lift up the prayers, the joys, and the concerns of every person gathered here today. We know that with a group so big, there are a lot of things that people are very joyful for, for and other things that they are holding heavy in their heart. And, and we pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will lift those prayers directly to you. We pray, God, that you would continue to watch over our country. We are... We are in a bit of, uh, wow, just a lot of stuff going on right now, and our country needs you, Lord. We pray for our leaders. We pray, God, for people getting out and voting. Um, we, just, we just pray, God, we pray for an end to this coronavirus. We pray that one of these vaccines, or more than one, that are in process right now, God, will come out with just absolutely fantastic results and that process will begin to start we continue to pray god for our students and teachers and parents and everyone who's being involved this year lord in the teaching of our young our young students our two grandsons are online lord learning every single day completely online and we know that there are various family circumstances in this group so uh, regarding that homeschooling we just pray, God, that you would hold us close all week. And Lord, if we don't feel your presence, help us to just stop for a minute and realize, God, that we are the ones that have stepped away from you, that you are always there, our rock, our salvation, right there. We lift all these prayers up to you today, Lord. We pray them all in the great and glorious name of your still risen son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Bye, okay. everybody. Bye, everybody. We'll be back here at 3 o'clock tomorrow. Tomorrow. Ma Matthew, we're coming to the death of Jesus in our reading of Matthew's Gospel. So, yeah. Okay, so anyway, I hope you all have a great day today and, and enjoy the warm weather. Yes. We love you. Love Adios. you guys. Bye. Bye-bye.